Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we're glad you could join us for another hour of good gardening. We love to hear from our audience. You can submit those questions and pictures for a future show by sending us an email to byf at unl.edu. You do need to tell us where you live. Give us as much information as you can about your gardening issue. We'd also like to invite you to follow Backyard Farmer on our social media channels, YouTube and Facebook. As always, we start the show with samples and we've got a creature in a box. Yes, so today I brought with me some slimy slugs. And yes, slugs can be plant pests. Hostas, for example, are one of their favorites. And a lot of the times they kind of go unnoticed in the landscape. That's because they're kind of more nocturnal in nature. They hide away from the heat of the day. And people just end up seeing these irregular shaped holes in the leaves and aren't quite sure what's causing it. Um, so first and foremost, for management of slugs, you wanna make the environment as least favorable for them as possible. Mulch, for example, make sure your mulch isn't too thick or deep. So the deeper the mulch, the more hiding spots, the cooler it gets for them. So try to keep it about one inch thick. You can also water during the morning to make sure that excess water has more time to evaporate during the day. And then just make sure your garden's just generally cleaned up of leaf litter as well. Trapping slugs is also relatively easy. You can put down a board, you can put down wet burlap, newspaper. I've also heard that stale beer works pretty well, but the next time you visit your garden, you can simply lift up that board or that burlap and then just pick slugs up one by one, throw them into some soapy water to kill them, and that does the trick really well. And lastly, if you have really severe infestations of slugs, you can use a pesticide labeled for slugs. So look for active ingredients like metaldehyde, iron phosphate, or ferric sodium. And remember that they are not insects. They are not insects, they're <laughs> gastropods. Exactly, edible or not. Ugh. Okay, Matt, what did you no. bring? I know, I ain't eating those. Um, <laughs> I actually brought just a list of some herbicides. So. This time of year, you know, your your yard and your, let's say, driveway are gonna have weeds that are just growing like crazy. And when it gets hot like this, they just seem to blow up. I'd say in the last week, purslane is probably quadrupled in size, same with spurge. Uh, in some of these areas where you're treating them, uh, there's a lot of different products that can work. Uh, some are better than others for certain places. Uh, so I just basically made a list of certain herbicides here that are sold as kind of a ground clear. Um, there's a bunch of different types. I mean, you get into the store and you look at them, you have uh, different ones like weed and grass killer, um, you know, ground clear, 365. Uh, so Roundup makes a few products, ortho. Um, there's a bunch of different brands also. So I just kind of wanted to go through a few of these. So if we're looking at the top left here, um, this one is sold as um, weed and grass killer and it has glufosinate in it. It's not glyphosate, it's a different active ingredient, and it, it is more of a, you wanna get good contact on your weeds, and it'll kill them pretty well, uh, as long as you're over that 50 to 60 degree temperature. Um, so a lot of the other ones that we usually use have Diquat or Fluazifop. Uh, Diquat is a contact herbicide that kills quickly. Uh, a lot of these products do have Diquat in them. Uh, so if we get over to the right, Roundup makes one with glyphosate in it, uh, Imazepic, which is the 365. So Imazepic actually has a pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, it prevents new weeds from growing. That's why they call it Roundup 365. And that also has Diquat in it for a quick burn down. So if we go down to the bottom here, uh, Roundup for lawns, you can see that there's no glyphosate or any uh, non-selective weed control in here. There's MCPA, 2,4-D, quinclorac, dicamba, and sulfentrazone. Uh, so these are all, you know, safe on turf. That's why it's called uh, Roundup kills the uh, kills the weeds, not the lawn. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're picking the right product. Uh, this one, if you're spraying it, you know, around any sensitive plants, it has dicamba in it, and quinclorac, and 2,4-D. So all of these are volatile. So if you're spraying on a day like today, next to let's say tomatoes or some sensitive plants, uh, it has very high potential of moving off target and killing anything close, even though you're trying to stay within mm -hmm. a small area. Uh, so moving to the next one, here's some of the organic products. Uh, sodium chloride, which is just salt, but when we have high temperatures like this, uh, it works very well at killing almost any weed or any grass out there. Uh, grasses tend to grow back, but a lot of the broadleaves, it'll kill pretty well. 
Uh, another one, ammonium soap, ammoniated soap uh, by Natria. That's another one that works well and it kills a lot of the broadleaf weeds and it says down to the roots. Uh, so there's some safer products and these are actually labeled that you can use around vegetables because there is no active in there that's going to be uh, dangerous if we do, let's say, get it on the plant, mm -hmm. except for you don't want to get it on the plant because it'll still kill it. Um, and then the last one is another one. It's just uh, a soapy salt basically that uh, kills the plant and it's very quick. So you'll see the results from some of these organics within, you know, three, four hours. Uh, so there are options other than some of those that are, you know, the norm but some of those you do not want to use next to sensitive plants or near a garden or types like that. Excellent, so read the label. Yes, read the label. Many products to choose from, some are better than others and some work better in other areas. Perfect, thanks Matt. Right. Thanks. All right, John, it's not what it's supposed to be, is it? It's not, so this is from my own personal garden and as you can tell, this is a beautiful cone flower. <laughs> Right. Uh, so this is supposed to be one of the newer cone flowers. I think it's sombrero sangrita or something like that. It's supposed to be like an orangey red cone flower. So if you've seen like echinacea, the purple cone flower is an orange version of that. Usually what, you know, two, three feet tall and beautiful uh, flowers. So this is the whole plant <laughs> that came up and this is the flower. Uh, so you see that uh, it doesn't exactly look how it's supposed to look. It popped up and I was like, wow, I don't remember planting a weird little green flower. Uh, and then I realized what was going on. So the mother plant is still there. This is like a baby plant that popped up off of the side, a side shoot. Uh, and it's unusual that the mother doesn't, always have the, doesn't also have this issue. This is called aster yellows and it's a, a disease. Uh, and what happens is that it, the disease causes what's, what we would call maybe a witch's broom. So you see the same thing in a tree where you see the branch and like, then there's like a bunch of growth and it looks like a broom. Um, this is just that version in a, a small plant. Uh, and we can actually uh, blame, it's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, it's called a phytoplasma. Uh, it's a bacteria-like um, microorganism, but we can ultimately blame a bug <laughs> uh, because it is spread by an aster leafhopper. Uh, this disease can only live within the veins of a host plant, like a cone flower or sometimes like a black eyed Susan. Those types of plants are the ones that get this. Or it could live in the gut of that leaf hopper. So the way that it spreads, it doesn't spread by the air or other plants. It spreads by the bug feeding on this plant and then going and feeding on another plant and infecting it. So the only thing that you can do is to remove it, or as Nebraskans would say, to rogue it out, <laughs> uh, right? That's, we don't use that term where I come from, so I, I had to like look it up in a, like a Nebraska dictionary to figure it out, um, because you don't want this spreading to your other plants. So I'll have to watch all my other plants in this family to make sure that they don't have it next year. And put that in the trash can before you leave. Right, it'll go in the trash can. You can put it in the compost, as long as you get your compost like above, I think, like 90 degrees, it will kill the phytoplasma. Excellent, thanks John. All right, you have four uh, questions for your first ones, Kate. Uh, the first you have two pictures of, uh, this is an Omaha viewer, abnormal phlox plants, thought it was drift, but then she sent pictures that have several small striped insects. What is this and what is the solution? Yes, so those are phlox plant bugs, and that is what is causing that damage that you're seeing on the phlox plant right there. So one thing to keep in mind about the phlox, the phlox plant bug, that's kind of a tongue twister, <laughs> phlox plant bug, is that they overwinter as eggs in the dead phlox stems. So come winter time, it's really important to clean up the area, get rid of the old stems, get rid of the leaf litter to prevent a reinfestation the next year. Right now, it's a little late to spray something. You can knock some that you see into soapy water or um, perhaps an insecticidal soap will do the trick. All right, thank you. Your next one is, uh, this is a Blair viewer that says, what are these insects on the back of their oak leaves and how do we get rid of them? So those are really teeny tiny aphids. So aphids on trees usually aren't a huge issue. They're not going to cause long-term problems for the tree. They're kind of relatively harmless. And a lot of natural enemies usually do the trick for you. If it becomes a huge issue, you can get a hose and start spraying them off, but usually that's as far as our recommendations go. 
All right. Uh, your next one is also an Omaha viewer. This is a red oak. Uh, cut off a small branch, found this interesting small round ball, and we actually, uh, we had two or three people send us exactly the same thing. Yeah, so this is a really cool example of an oak apple gall, and an oak apple gall is caused from a cynipid wasp laying its egg on the leaf, and what happens is the plant kind of overreacts to that egg being there. It produces a lot of hormones, which produces this gall, and usually galls and trees are going to be completely harmless, you know. Um, if you really want to, you can trim off the galls that you see and kind of rake in the fall to get rid of the wasps, but I would just leave it be. I think they're just sort of fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt, uh, your questions. You have two for this first one. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer. They took out a large silver maple about 15 years ago, replaced it with a red maple. The roots have begun to show around the new tree, but the hillside, which is what we're looking at, so there's the roots and there's mm -hmm. the, the hill. Deep depressions, the grass won't grow. They know what they can and can't do about the exposed roots, but what do we do about that hillside in particular? Is there any way to get turf to grow in there? Uh, probably the main reason that the, the hillside isn't growing is if they did take out an old tree and they're, they were talking about a depression in there too, uh, it's probably old decaying either the stump or the roots that are decaying and it's actually inhibiting water from getting down there because it's hydrophobic most likely, or it's just you know not allowing water to s stay saturated in the soil. And on a side hill like that, water runs off pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So without having some sort of irrigation um, normally there, uh, maybe a better way to do that would be to do a mulched area and put in a flower bed or something like that because the grass is never gonna really wanna grow there. And I don't know how tough. you'd ever mow that anyway. Yeah, it's a little too okay. steep for, for mowing. Yeah. So it might be better to dig some of that soil out and make a flower bed. All right, excellent. All right, your next one here, uh, actually you have two more here and they're from different viewers. The first, um, what is causing these brown spots in the bluegrass? He thinks it's dollar spot, it's in the shade. This, this one, you can see that in the center of each of these, there's like a green, mm -hmm. green spot and that's kind of typical of brown patch. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll start and it'll kind of move outwards and sometimes that, that center has a green, uh, green uh, appearance to it. And usually you can see if you zoom in close enough on some of these leaves, there's a lesion in between the top and the bottom of the leaf. So right in the middle, there's a brown lesion on that leaf. And that's, that's usually a telltale sign of brown patch. In a lawn like this, um, usually it'll recover, but if you want to prevent it in the future, uh, try not to water where overnight, try to water earlier in the morning or earlier in the afternoon to where that, that leaf wetness isn't staying on throughout the night. Uh, and usually it's when we have 70 degree temperatures at night or above, and that's when it really kicks into action. Another thing would be aerate the lawn when, not now, but in the fall, try and get rid of some of that thatch to prevent it. All right, and your next one is, uh, they're saying this is the third of these brown spots that appear, they eventually disappear, uh, and this is, uh, this is in Columbus. Okay, and th this one, it kinda looks similar to that brown patch, but what I'm seeing on the, if I zoomed in on it, the, the leaves were dying from the top down. Uh, it looks like it just kinda smoked them, but there's new growth at the bottom. Um, it can be asakaida, which happens a lot when we have this really hot, temperatures, it stresses the grass when we've had, you know, inadequate moisture or periods of wet and dry. And this one really shows up in sometimes even bigger patches or even on the wheel tracks of the mower where the grass is stressed. So uh, generally it just grows out of it. There's not much treatment you can do if that's what it is, um, but generally they grow out of it. All right, thank you, Matt. All right, John, uh, this is a, a viewer, uh, you've got two pictures here. Um, her husband is a farmer, puzzled about the dying garden, planted in May, so they've been in the ground about three weeks. One to two plants are dying each day. He's ruled out spray because the plants are dying a couple at a time and the weeds aren't dying, just the plants. So what, what do we think here? They have gotten plenty of rain. They're in Tecama, so they're eastern part of the state. Any ideas on this, or what do we tell them to do now? So this is this is weird. Like I've not seen something like this mm -hmm. before. I would do a little investigation to see is there something maybe affecting the roots? Like is it overwatering and like root rot? 
Uh, do you have, you know, like call up Dennis and talk about voles, uh, see if something's eating the roots. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you don't think it's spray, uh, and you know, these crops that look like more like a, a coal crop, like a cabbage, those typically don't have as much like spray, like drift issues as say tomatoes. Like mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk a lot about tomatoes in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so that one is kind of a, a mystery to me. I'd, soil sample maybe? Yeah, I would do a soil sample. I would do a little investigation yeah. just to see, you know, did you, you know, is there too much fertility? Is there too much water? Mm -hmm. You know, that's or a vole. Of, I mean, that's a, a really interesting thought on that. Yeah, too. like if one or two because they they eat roots, right? You know, and we typically see them eating like woody plants in the winter. Mm -hmm. and maybe they're you know having a nice succulent cabbage for <laughs> for, for a summer snack. for a spring snack, right? <laughs> All right. Okay. Your next one is a Wahoo viewer. A drift from spray hit the tomatoes and the peppers. You've got two pictures here. Uh, he's wondering, will they recover, and can the fruit be eaten, or should he start over? So those, you know, we see that that curling in the tomatoes, and, and you can learn more uh, on the next Digging Deeper, right? Um, we're going to talk about drift, and you can see, you can look it up uh, a lot on there, uh, or online, uh, where you see that curling. Uh, this looks maybe, this one looks more like glyphosate damage, maybe, where it turns white. Um, and so... Really, yes, they probably will grow out if the damage is not bad enough, but we always try to recommend that you not do that because uh, as Matt was talking about earlier, you know, some of those products, we don't know what the safety is for use on vegetable crops, like if you don't know exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we would recommend against uh, using, using those. So take those plants out, replant them if you can find plants to do that because we don't know what the safety, because most of those things like, they're not tested for use on a right. vegetable, so we don't know if it's safe. All right, thank you, John. Well, we have a real treat for you tonight as we show you some fantastic native wildflowers propagated in a Lincoln residence backyard. And the amazing thing is they started growing these specimens just last year. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Master Gardener Gary Bell and see his amazing yard. I started back in gardening again about 12 years ago. Um, I was a fruit and vegetable kind of gardener and I decided to get back to my roots. Uh, I took entomology in college and I started a butterfly garden. And then um, I learned more about bumblebees and I decided to expand it to a bumblebee garden as well. And then expanded it to a wild bee garden as well, so it was a full pollinator garden. And I started filling up along fences beside the house in front of the barn. And about the time that I ran out of space, I got interested in prairies. And I realized that most of my pollinator plants were actually prairie plants that would have been growing here 200 years ago. So I decided to take part of my yard and convert it to native grasses and sedges and wildflowers. I had experience on growing plants in a large scale uh, from my pollinator gardens. I dug up one part of the yard and completely filled it with plants and I had plants left over. So I started plugging them in along the edges of my buffalo grass part of the yard. It was an experiment, I wasn't sure what would happen. And the next spring, uh, it was like a miracle. Like everything came back up again. Uh, it grew to size, it bloomed. Uh, the wildflowers kind of took over the grasses, which I need to still fine tune. But um, it was a success. And so then the next year, uh, I grew a lot of plants for a charity sale, which didn't happen because of the COVID. Um, so I started digging up my property next door and filled it with plants as well. So that's about where we are now. Um, the plants that I'm standing around right now started, uh, I started the seeds about a year ago, February. So this is really about one year's growth. And in the other part of the prairie, those seeds would have been started a little over two years ago. and. Uh, and they're mature plants now, so it doesn't take very long. Um, so there's a, 
There's a big movement right now of using native plants in urban landscapes um, as opposed to alien ones. And one of the reasons is um, the urban landscape is a habitat for native insects and birds. And in some cases, the urban habitat is as important as the rural habitat around it because the urban habitat can be more diverse than what's left over around the edges of town with uh, farming and development and so forth. And if everyone were to plant part of their yard in native pollinator plants, it would actually be a huge environment, almost like a national park for insects. And so as I've increased my diversity here in my yard, the diversity of butterflies and bees keeps going up every year. It's just wonderful to see all those beautiful plants. And we might hear from Gary again later in the season as he tells us how to propagate them. So that will be fun too. That's really a neat place. All right, Kate, uh, your first one here is an ID north of North Platte. What is this creature and how does he control it on his plants? So that is an American rose chafer, which is a scarab beetle. And they tend to like rose flowers and peonies and the like. And they're big enough where you can simply pluck them off, dunk them in some soapy water. We generally don't recommend any insecticides, especially on the flowers, because that can affect pollinators. Excellent. Your next um, picture is Sac City, Iowa. Found these hairs on an onion plant. What are these? <laughs> yeah, so this is a really cool picture. These are actually lacewing eggs. So lacewings are beneficial predators in the landscape, both as larvae and as adults. And they're laid on kind of these stalks to prevent cannibalism between the larvae, and they also protect the eggs from foraging ants. All right, and one more ID, and this one is a creature found on Stokes Aster, which is a beautiful flower. What is this? Yeah, so this is a pretty interesting one. I'm pretty sure it is a moth pupa. So that's kind of the cocoon stage, but not really a cocoon form of the moth. Um, and. I think it's gonna be harmless. It's just gonna turn into a moth and probably fly away. All right, thanks, Kate. All right, uh, let's see. Matt, you have two viewers who sent us pictures or questions about, is there a way to get rid of bindweed other than pulling it? This actually, one of our viewers says they're terribly allergic. And the other one, uh, that's an mm -hmm. Omaha viewer. The other one is in Lindsay, Nebraska and says, please help. Yeah, field, <laughs> field bindweed is a pain in the butt. Because mm -hmm. it, it's a perennial, actually. It, it has uh, rhizomes underground, and it can spread pretty rapidly. Especially this time of year, it'll grow, it seems like, a foot in a day. And then you pull it, and it comes back. So if it's in a turf setting, and you don't have a lot of susceptible plants around, like tomatoes, uh, products containing quinclorac work very well on this. So if you look at the active ingredients, uh, quinclorac should be one of them. Uh, a lot of other 24, or 2,4-D, let's say, uh, dicamba work too, but this time of year it's tough to spray those around anything, uh, especially within a landscape. Uh, so if it's in bare ground or um, in landscape beds, some of those products I mentioned earlier that are somewhat safer from uh, volatizing would be a good uh, selection for controlling this and it would work quite well. All Otherwise, right. keep pulling. <laughs> All right, your next one uh, is a ID, they, she thought it was bindweed, but it's not, and clearly the, f the flowers are different. Primary leaves, no, no milky sap, and this is Shenandoah, Iowa. Okay, yeah, this one is actually similar, but not, yeah, not field bindweed. It's wild buckwheat, which is also called black bindweed because of the seeds, uh, but same thing, it is a weed. Um, it's usually in a, I mean, in crop settings, uh, it can be a detrimental weed because it wraps around and just creates a lot of chaos when it comes to harvest. Uh, same thing for the landscape, they'll grow really fast and take over whatever plant they're growing on. Uh, so the best way to get rid of these, if there's not very many of them, is get down and find where it's the root is and pull the whole plant out and that'll take care of it. Because it, it is an annual, so if you pull them out and don't let them seed, they won't be around next year. Excellent. Then you have uh, an Omaha viewer who says this clover-like growth, and it's clover, continues to spread. He's wondering if weed be gone will get rid of clover. Um, I would wait until fall. Uh, this is a really good stand of clover. So either <laughs> that or don't fertilize your lawn and leave the clover. 
and you can have a clover grass lawn indefinitely. <laughs> All right, perfect. And then uh, one more from Beatrice. They want to know, uh, this came up in a, a wildflower planting, weed or wildflower? Definitely a weed, common uh, lamb's quarters. Mm -hmm. And this one is very common across, I think, the whole continent and world. Uh, it is a summer annual and it'll grow rapidly from here on out. So best, I mean, really easy to control just by chopping off at the base and they won't, they won't come back. So just pull them out or chop them off at the base. Or eat them. And eat them, they're related to spinach. Are they so delicious? Chop it off Never had yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, John, your first one here is a Seward viewer. They planted uh, zebra grass, which is uh, one of the miscanthuses. Last spring grew great, looked great. They overwintered it, cut it down, but it's doing the dead center thing. So they're wondering, should they do any, have done anything differently? What do they do about this dead center? Yeah, it's hard to know what actually caused that. It could have been improper planting. It could have been the plant when you bought it. Uh, it could have been uh, winter, uh, so it's really hard to know, but what you would do now is just to remove that. Um, if you wanted it to grow more back toward the center, you'd want to make sure you amend that soil to give it something nice to grow back toward. Otherwise, you're probably going to end up with a grass donut. <laughs> exactly. All right, your next two pictures are uh, Emerald Arbor Vita, and this is Ellicott City, Maryland, which is great fun. Uh, five of these planted a year ago. They've been doing well, but then we're getting these brownish branches, brown areas. What to do about this? What do we think here? I'm thinking probably uh, just because of the pattern of that, it probably looks more like winter damage, which we get drying out in the winter. It gets cold, the air's really dry. Probably like wind blowing through that little tunnel of trees that you've got there. You see it on the, those inside edges there. Uh, that's probably the most likely cause of that. I mean, there, you know, there are always insects and diseases that affect things, but given that kind of damage, that's what it looks like to me. All right, uh, and your final one here is uh, kind of classic this year. What to do about this Japanese maple because this is what they've got for growth. Yeah, so you know, you've had some winter damage or some sort of damage that's killed out, you know, the majority of that tree, so you know, what doesn't have leaves on it is not gonna have leaves on it, it's, it's gone. So prune it out, see what you have left. Do you love it? Then <laughs> you can leave it, you know. It's sort of like the, you know, that, that show uh, where you, you, know, you love your house or you sell your house. You're like, so you either gotta love this tree the way it is or you gotta dig it out and <laughs> plant something fair. else. All right, thanks, John. Well, hot and dry, that is what is happening across the state. And since we just got our garden planted, soil moisture will be critically important in the weeks to come. Here to tell us more from the Backyard Farmer Garden is Terry James. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are getting ready for all of those dry summer days that are ahead of us. We've seen a few of them across the state, few rains coming across, but very hit and miss. So we're making sure that our soil is ready and we're gonna preserve as much moisture in our gardens as possible. We have all of our beds mulched. Uh, we are using different kinds of mulch, whether it be wood mulch or some straw that we've had extra that's been sitting around. Uh, we're also making sure that we are on a good water schedule. So we're watering early in the day, letting that water and moisture dry off those leaves all day long so they're not going into the night so that we're not harboring any kind of diseases or getting any diseases on our plants. Our plants are looking great and having this soil moisture preserved in these upcoming hot summer days is really gonna benefit us in the future. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now it is time for the lightning round. All right, John, are you ready? Always. <laughs> We have a viewer who has 30 tomato plants, has a curling top on one of the 30. He pruned it out. Is that enough or should he do something different? I would go ahead and just take it out. You don't know if it's drift or curly top virus. Either way, you want it gone. All right. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer who used weed barrier and then mulch in the garden. They want to know how they should check to see whether or not they need to water. You would want to figure out how to get, get underneath there and. Um, we don't recommend a lot of that anymore, so have fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is an Omaha viewer who uh, heard that crushed eggshells would benefit peppers and tomatoes. Is that a yes or a no? 
eventually, but it'll take so long for them to break down that really you would, you know, incorporate them into the compost. Um, they're not going to help immediately. All right. Uh, this is a Utica viewer who wants to know, is it too late to plant a peach tree? And if so, when should it be planted? Uh, it's too late to plant a peach tree. You would plant them in the fall. Peaches are really hard to grow here. Uh, so you might want to double think that as well. All right. Uh, this is a Plattsmith viewer who wants to know if they could start a June bearing strawberry bed in the fall. Yes, you can plant those in the fall. All right. Nice job. Okay, Matt, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Your first question is uh, Logan, Iowa in the Lost Hills. They want to know whether weed and feed will kill brome. No. <laughs> This is a Cass County viewer who has uh, chickweed, clover, and oxalis, found a, found a spray that says it would control all those, but wonders whether they should wait till fall. Uh, some of those are summer annuals, so they won't matter, but yes, fall is the best time for perennial weeds. Now, summer annuals are gonna be dying now in the summer. All right, this is an Alliance viewer who is going to uh, seed a mix of buffalo and blue grama wants to know, is there any cool season grass that has the same low management, low height, and low water requirements? Um, some of the fine fescues would be a good choice to put with those. All right, uh, this is a papillion viewer who says, what is the name for the herbicide that kills wild onions? Uh, Roundup didn't work. Um, 2,4-D actually has good activity on wild onions, but usually it's in the spring. All right, nut sedge is six inches tall. What to use now? Um, sedge hammer still works really well, which is halo sulfuron, or sulfentrazone, which is dismissed. Works, both of those work pretty good on controlling. Excellent, nice job. All right, Kate, you ready? Yes. All right, uh, this, is a, this is a viewer uh, from York who wants to know how to control the aphids on their milkweed plants. Um, leave them be or spray with a hose. All right, this is a Western Nebraska viewer, Western the city, the town, has two trees with carpenter ants and they were cut the trees down. How should they dispose of the wood so the carpenter ants don't come back? Um, you can treat it with seven dust or just dispose of normally. All right, um, this is a Plattsmouth viewer who's asking for the magic plant after date for squash plants to reduce the incidence of squash vine borer. There is none the fall. <laughs> All right. This is a Sioux City viewer who is overrun with chiggers and ticks. Is there a way to treat uh, but avoid hurting the pollinators? Um, the best thing you can do is just keep your landscapes manicured, mow, they like the tall grasses. All right. This is a Michigan viewer who wants to know how to control webworms in their orchard. Um, prune before it gets too bad. Um, spray with BT early on. All right, uh, ants under a driveway slab. Ants can live outdoors. <laughs> so just let them, yes. let them be, let them be. It's a win, we gave you that last one since you sort of sort of knew. Yes. <laughs> All right, the grace period is over for her, not right, ever yeah. again. Like, yeah, that's your, la that's your last grace period there. <laughs> All right, John, what do we have for Plants of the Week? <laughs> so we have uh, three nice ones here in the garden. So this little uh, white dealy here, this is Feverfew. Uh, it's a perennial full sun. Um, it does need deadheading to keep it from seeding because it will take over. It will reseed itself quite a bit. Uh, and then we have this nice uh, yellow uh, one here. This is a uh, Coreopsis. This is stiff Coreopsis, probably because the stems are very stiff. Mm -hmm. uh, if you like, it's, it's very stiff there. Uh, perennial, it's a native, uh, nice full foliage and gold color. Uh, and pollinators tend to, to like these things. Uh, and then the purple ones here, these are Larkspur. It is an annual, uh, but it will reseed itself. So uh, we have those, uh, we have, they come in uh, blue, white, pink, those kind of colors. And mm -hmm. so that's the plant of the week. That's what you'll find out there right now. Exactly. If they haven't roasted today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And they, so far they hadn't, but who knows by now. All right, uh, Kate, your next set of questions here. This is an Omaha viewer. Notice these strange red spots in the knockout roses. Will they kill them? All the roses are not affected. So those look like it could possibly be done by flower thrips, and those are generalists, and they're kind of hard to get rid of because they migrate from plant to plant really easily. I don't believe they'll kill the plant, but you can just prune off all the dead and dying flowers. 
All right. And interestingly enough, there actually was a rose uh, variety called Freckles one year that looked exactly <laughs> like this. <laughs> All right. Your next one is a Malcolm viewer. Um, they have raspberry plants starting to die. They found a small hole in the bottom of one of the stems. Stem was hollow. And of course, then the tops are doing this. What has caused it and what can they do? So this is the raspberry cane borer, which is a type of beetle. And you'll notice on that second picture, there was kind of two lines of puncture marks around the, um, below the wilted, wilted stems. So what you need to do to prevent that beetle from causing more damage is to prune one or two inches below that bottom puncture line and then get rid of the infested stems. All right, excellent. Okay, Matt, um, this is a viewer at Johnson Lake and apparently whatever this is, is taking over the yard at Johnson Lake. What is it? And she, I think we have a picture of it taking over yeah, too. Yeah, it is taking over. And what it, what it looks like is wild violet. Um, and it can spread by rhizomes and also seed. So year after year, when it has thin bare areas like this, it's just gonna keep spreading. So if you, if you want a ground cover of some sort, stick with it. Otherwise you're gonna have to either, um, you know, make sure this area is sprayed out with the pre-emergent uh, to prevent it from coming up while also doing a fall uh, application of a uh, herbicide containing either triclopyr or 2,4-D to control these, these wild violet from coming back for next year. All right, uh, your next one is a Lincoln viewer. Wants to know what this plant slash weed is. Pops up everywhere that she has a bare spot. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty, uh, it does a good job of finding a bear spot too. It's a water pod, and this one is a summer annual, and it typically has almost no roots on it. Whenever I find it and I pull it up, it's like, how is this even growing? It has a really weak tap root, um, but it is a annual, so you wanna get it before it, it makes like a pea-like uh, seed structure underneath, has like light blue flowers, and it'll be flowering here soon and making seed already, so either just pull it out, and that's, that's pretty much the easiest way to do it. All right, and your, your final one here is a Hospers Iowa viewer. Uh, she sees a lot of these weeds. What is it and how to control this? Uh, this is Curly Dock, and it is probably found in every state and every continent around the world. It's pretty common, uh, one of the most widely spread weeds around. And to kill this one, it has a really deep taproot. Uh, so some sort of broadleaf herbicide is going to be needed because it needs to be able to um, translocate down into the root to kill the plant. So if you chop it off, it's just going to regrow. Um, so you want to make sure you use some of those uh, 2,4-D dicamba, or the two that work really well. If it's in a pasture, um, Grazon, Picloram, those work really well on it as well, getting down to that root and killing it. All right. Thank you, Matt. Okay, your first one, John, is a Lincoln viewer. So dwarf apple tree had 72 apples set on it this year. Is that too many and what should they do? <laughs> yeah, th that is too many for that little tree. Uh, so you can remove some of those. I'm surprised that the tree actually hasn't dropped some on its own. It usually will actually abort if it has too many. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might see that especially after our heat uh, that the tree might abort some. So if you, you should really catch them earlier before the apples begin uh, to get too large and thin them out uh, because the tree's putting a lot of resources into those apples uh, and so they won't grow as big. So get them off uh, so you have nicer apples and you don't have broken branches and things like that. So five, six inch spacing? Yeah, you something. wanna do some, some spacing between them. Sometimes you'll see that there's a bunch of them in a cluster. You know, you really don't want more than like two together in a, in a bunch. So thin them out uh, and the tree won't be happier and you'll have better fruit. Excellent. All right, your next viewer here has um, five, they're, they're Bartzella peonies, which is an Ito or an interspecific. They planted them in the spring of 2020. They were very small when planted. No flowers last year, one this year. They're wondering why. It's slow to mature, planted too deep, young, what? Patience. Yeah. Uh, so if you plant them as a small plant, which you usually, you know, you get a lot of bare root plants or smaller perennials that are cheaper. Um, so with just patience, uh, it'll take a few years to get it established and then get it really blooming. Um, so there's a little saying that you might hear the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps. 
the third year it leaps. Uh, and that's how plants do. So the first year it's sort of getting its roots established. Second year it will sort of start creepily growing and then hopefully by the third year or the first, fourth year, depending on the plant, it'll start really growing and flowering. Right, and it's a little hard to tell f whether these are planted too deep. That would, that would affect flowering, but they're pretty young, so. Yeah, I mean, you could take a look at that. And sometimes people don't think about like the planting depth and then how much mulch you put around it. And so right. you wanna look at that. Excellent, thanks, John. This is also a peony uh, question. This is a Norfolk viewer. Very large peony, uh, three feet in diameter. Some of the buds were very small. She's wondering if she cuts out the smaller ones next year, will the others get larger or does she just let it be and they open differently? Right, so you can just let it be and you'll have a mix of flower, you know, flower sizes on there. If you just wanted big flowers, then if you ca caught them earlier, you could cut those small ones off like you know, like a, if you're picking them for a florist or selling them as like big flowers or like you just have to have them for your cousin's uncle's wedding or whatever, right. uh, then you can cut the little ones off and have bigger flowers. Right, that disbudding thing. Yeah. All right, excellent, thanks, John. Well, I don't have to remind anybody about the hot and dry weather we've been having, and that is true for further west of Lincoln, of course, also. We're fortunate to hear from Rocky Steinbrink of Steinbrink Landscaping in Kearney about the gardening differences between west central Nebraska and back here in Lincoln and Omaha. You know, one of the issues we have to look at is the, the amount of rainfall is always important. And Omaha and Lincoln will get on the average of about two to four or five inches more rain than we will on an annual basis. The wind is a little bit higher out here on a constant basis as well. So, you know, you're more protected. Um, you've got a lot more atmosphere to, to worry about. We're on the edge of what I'll call the sand hills of, of Nebraska. And so we get a little bit more extreme temperatures um, going back and forth. Um, our winters, uh, we get a little bit more snow. We get a little bit more um, rain, of course, um, and sleet. And we get a little bit of colder temperatures. So when you put all those together, that really creates a challenge because our plants go through a lot more extreme. You know, there's a lot less water, a little bit more conditions of wind. And so when you start looking at plants like, well, I grew this in Omaha, Nebraska. Well, yes, it could probably grow out here to a certain degree, but we have to give them a lot more protection. And so if we don't, then they, they don't really do as well type situation for us. Um, one of the goals that we always try to achieve is we want our plants for our customer, one, that we, we want them to be successful. And we also want the plant, plant to thrive, not just survive. So some of the plants that we carry that are made for this area are really, really hardy. They can take a lot of conditions um, from that standpoint. Some of our trees, you know, some of the more delicate crab apples and a few other of the flowering things like a weeping cherry, they do okay in Omaha and, Nebraska, uh, Omaha and Lincoln, but out here, we get a little bit of dieback each year. So we really try to say, hey, you need to have these in a protected area. You can't go out, put them out there. Some of the other shrubs and perennials, it's always easy for people to look online and say, oh, I like this plant, you know, type situation. And they forget that there are certain zones that they're supposed to live. Due to the fact that we are a little more exposed, um, all different areas, um, our insects and diseases um, have a tendency to, to really thrive in these conditions because it's hotter. A lot of insects like warm temperatures, so we see a lot more uh, diversified mix. Um, we get a lot of different ones that pop through, and so we're again, we're always trying to watch for the customer, and when we do see an insect invasion of a certain type of bug or worm or something, we try to notify a lot of our customers through Facebook and other different social medias, so then we can alert them that, hey, you be on the lookout, this is what you look for. Diseases, same way. Um, we, if we get real hot temperatures and all of a sudden we get a lot of moisture, um, a lot of our funguses and diseases start to step in. And so we really try to watch for the customer to be, be aware of what goes on because we go through a lot more extreme temperatures. There's a lot of different plants out there. You know, years ago it used to be, oh, let me put a couple of evergreens across the front and something on the upright uh, for on the corner. But today there's so many more perennials, there's so many more shrubs, there's so many more trees that their selection is just unreal. And new hybrids come out almost yearly and there's so many things. Um, do your education, 
do the studying, but you can also come out here. A lot of our plants are labeled. They tell you exactly what it's going to do, and we're here to help you out. You know, Rocky is totally right when he says gardeners need to think creatively the further you go west in the state and even in the east, so you're not using exactly the same plants all the time. Plenty of those plants that grow fine here in eastern Nebraska, they're either going to struggle out west or they're just going to give up the ghost. Okay, so Kate, last round here of uh, pictures. Your first two are fun. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer. They have these divots in the ground between the shrubs close to the foundation. What could it be? So those are immature antlions, also called doodle bugs, but they're called antlions because they make those little holes to trap ants. So they lie in wait at the bottom of those holes, wait for an ant to accidentally fall in. Sometimes they'll even flick up sand or dirt at the ant to make it fall in, but they're just beneficial predators. That's uh, the what is it called? The Sarlacc from Star Wars, mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah. So yeah, for entertainment, throw ants in. <laughs> exactly. All right, your next picture is a Lincoln viewer. Is this a friend or a foe? And do you treat for it if it's a foe? This is a friend. So this is another beneficial predator. And this is actually what lady beetles look like as a larva on the right and then a pupa on the left. Mm -hmm. And they're really hungry and they like aphids, so leave them be. Excellent. And uh, your final picture is, this is an Omaha viewer who found some visitors on the milkweed, lots of them. She's wondering what to do to ensure that these caterpillars uh, become pupa and then of course become beautiful butterflies. Should she avoid mowing? How much space should she give them? She doesn't use pesticides. What about watering? That's a great question. So the caterpillars are going to get all the water they need from feeding on the plant. And then these caterpillars in particular, they look like they're just about ready to pupate anyways. And what they're going to do is they're going to leave their host plant, maybe go pupate on the side <coughs> of a house, on a fence, somewhere kind of far away. That being said, I don't think you need to do anything special for them. You're already doing enough by giving them their host plant. Excellent. That'll be so much fun. Okay. Uh, your pictures. Your first three are from uh, one viewer and then a second right. uh, pic or fourth picture. So he has pictures of a thistle and he's, he's wondering is this one of the noxious weeds? Um, they're coming into his yard. He, he knows that if it is one of the noxious ones they do need to be removed. So he sent pictures of the leaves in bud <clears throat> and I think we have one that's in flower as well. Yep. And this one is a noxious weed, mm -hmm. and it's a big pain in the butt. I've <laughs> seen it uh, in a lot of areas that I manage as well, uh, and they, they tolerate mowing. It's Canada thistle or creeping thistle. So it, it does start out as one plant, and then it'll just continue to spread in a larger and larger circle. If left untreated, it can cover thousands of square feet because that, that seed will spread, and also the rhizomes from one plant to the next spread every year, so it just keeps growing and it is uh, real, it even tolerates mowing. So it, it's something that needs to be treated with, uh, if it's in a, let's say a pasture, uh, products with, uh, let's say, Triclopyr plus uh, Picloram, which is Grazon, work really well, but a lot of the other 240 products work. Um, so spraying it now would be really beneficial to keep it from seeding out. And also you're gonna have to spray again in the fall just to make sure you get those plants that you're not killing now. So it is something that you want to treat, otherwise it's it's going to continue to grow and get worse. And if it's a noxious weed, you're, yeah, you have you to. You should spread it, right. too. yes. And then your final one is also a thistle. Uh, this is uh, in Council Bluffs. She, she sent just a couple pictures of the foliage. Wonders if, is this native or non-native? Do we need a... Yeah, I mean, most of these thistles are not native. They actually came from Europe hundreds of years ago, and then they pretty much spread to all the states throughout the United States, and they're pretty widely distributed. Now, this one's actually bull thistle, and it is very sharp, <laughs> sharp looking. It's one of the, I guess, more aggressive ones. That's why they call it bull thistle. Uh, but this is another one. It's not, It's it might be invasive to some counties in the in Nebraska, but not all of them. Uh, but it's one that you definitely want to get rid of to prevent it from spreading throughout the landscape. All right, excellent, thanks, Matt. Okay, John, your first one here is a Grand Island viewer, and they want to know the identity of this roadside flower. It's in a new wildflower bed. What is this? 
So this is a poppy mallow, and then the cute little flower there. Uh, so it is a native, uh, and it sort of lives rocky hillsides, drier areas, uh, and it and it is like a, a good ground cover kind of plant. So you can, I don't know if I've ever seen it for sale. I'm sure you can buy it. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes a great ground cover plant if you see it out there, poppy mallow. It, it's actually fairly widely available and we have a beautiful one in the backyard farmer garden in exactly those conditions that you suggested. Yeah, so if you have a nice, you know, <coughs> like rocky, dry area that you mm -hmm. need something to grow, other than, you know, some sort of weed that you'll have to send to Matt for ID, <laughs> uh, then you can get, get you some poppy mallow. All right, your next one, uh, two pictures are also, a, can you tell us the name of this plant? This is in Pillion. So this one has a little harder name. I don't get like fun names like doodlebug and mm -hmm. you know antlion. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Lysomachia. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is not a native, uh, but you can grow it, you can buy it. Uh, sometimes it's called yellow loose strife. Uh, and um, so you can grow it in the garden. It will spread so you can like keep it under control. You might need to like mow it back or prune it back if it starts to you know misbehave. Uh, but that is one that you can, you know, you can find. So, Lysomachia. Excellent. And then your final one here is um, this. This plant is growing in a cemetery by her, her grandparents' headstone in Tecumseh. She is from Hildreth. So, what is this? So, this is actually the seed stage, not the flower stage. If you would have caught it, you know, like a few weeks earlier, you would have seen yellow flowers all over this. Uh, and this is called yellow rocket. Uh, rocket is um, something that we describe some things in the mustard family. So you might have heard of arugula called rocket uh, as a salad plant. Uh, there's dame's rocket, which is like a purple flower. Uh, this is yellow rocket. So it is a weed. Uh, it's not an, an attractive weed. It's like a yellow, yellow flower. Uh, it will spread by those seeds. You know, you have all those little pods that will burst open and spread. So it's not anything that, you know, I would, you would have to run and control. You might, it will spread. So if you don't want it growing everywhere, you can do that. Uh, but it's also something that you don't have to save either. All right, excellent. Thanks, John.